نسأل الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا الله سبحانه وتعالى says that indeed you have in the conduct in the أسوة in the manners of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم a very good example to follow so the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is nothing but good for us nothing but an exemplary manner, a pattern around which we can mold our lives and of the greatest blessings of a student of knowledge of one who tries to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he turn to the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he study the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties the ups and the downs of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and by this he increases his Iman. By this, he comes closer to the Prophet ﷺ. Through this study, he will be able to understand who Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Rasulullah ﷺ was. And through this study, he will benefit in his practical and daily life. He is not the first to traverse this path of the worship of Allah. Rather, many are the people that have come before him, far better than him, far more greater and noble than him. And on the head of them, on the top of them, is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Muslim, whatever difficulty he faces, when he looks to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he finds far greater difficulties, far greater tests and tribulations. Whatever good that happens to him, he can look at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and see how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also dealt with such good. And one of the most critical times in the history of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the treaty is the incident known as the treaty of Hudaybiyyah and this occurred during the sixth year after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hijrah from Mecca to Medina six years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had migrated from the land of Mecca he saw in a dream and we know that the dreams of the prophets, all of them are a type of inspiration from Allah. He saw in a dream that he had shaved his hair off of his head. And that he had entered the Masjid al-Haram, doing tawaf around the Kaaba. So he took this as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would go and perform the Umrah, the small Hajj, the lesser pilgrimage in that year. Because that is what you do when you go for Umrah, you shave your hair off and you do tawaf around uh, the Kaaba. So when the Prophet sallallahu saw this in a dream, he took this as a sign that he would perform Umrah in that year. So he told the companions around him to prepare that they were going for Umrah to the city of Mecca. 1,400 of the companions responded to his call. And they left Medina in their ihram, in their garments only armed with their traveling swords because as you know in ihram you are not allowed to wear armor you're not allowed to wear to go as if you're going for war because one of the conditions of ihram is that you do not carry weapons around so they did not take any defensive measures they did not put on any armor any protection nor did they take their fighting swords rather they only took the bare minimum to protect themselves from the desert animals and the beasts of prey the bare minimum that they had needed to take in order to go for umrah so look here at the Iman of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It is a very tense situation. The battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, the battle of the Ahzab, all of these have occurred. They are at a state of war with an enemy, the Mushrikun at Mecca. Yet when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam announces that they're going to go for Umrah, they leave their families, they leave their households, they leave their professions and jobs, and they march forth towards their enemies, armed only with their Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not even wearing their armor. Two white sheets of cloth around them. Look at the tawakkul, the trust that they had in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the iman that they had in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is verily a sign of their status. 
an indication of their greatness and their majesty. The majesty and the greatness of the Sahaba, the best generation of Islam. When the Mushrikun heard that the Prophet ﷺ had left Medina, obviously they do not know why. And they are worried, they're concerned, they're in a dilemma. Why is he, why is he left Medina? Is he going to attack us? Is he going to surprise us? So they send out their most famous warrior, Khalid ibn al-Walid, with a small army, as much as they could muster up at that time. They sent him out. The Prophet ﷺ got wind of this through the inspiration, through the wahi from Allah. And he told the Sahaba that verily Khalid ibn al-Walid has come and he is camped at a place called Ghamim. He is camped at this place with a small troop from the Quraysh. So we will take the right hand path. We will go around them. So due to this tactic, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they were able to go around Khalid ibn al-Walid without him knowing about the Muslims. And when Khalid ibn al-Walid realized what had occurred, he immediately went around and went back to Mecca informing the mushrikun, the mushrikun over there that he had failed in his mission. The Prophet ﷺ has already advanced to Mecca and they don't know what he is going to do. And this is yet one of the many, many miracles of the Prophet ﷺ that Allah informed him of the tactics of Khalid and no one else knew of this. It was a top secret tactic. But the Prophet ﷺ had received the inspiration from Allah. And also look at the tactics of war that the Prophet ﷺ used. Even though he had no formal military training, yet he was a military genius. And anyone that studied the battles of the Prophet ﷺ, and the day after tomorrow we will discuss the battle of Uhud, he will realize that this without a doubt is another indication of his prophethood. In our times, in order to become a general, you must study years and years of specialized training. There are special schools set aside to study the tactics of war, how to encounter the enemy, when to attack, what to do. Yet the Prophet ﷺ had no such schooling. And he did not need this schooling. Because the inspiration was coming down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him. So the Muslims kept on approaching Mecca. Until finally they reached a valley outside of Mecca called Al-Hudaybiyyah. And when they reached this valley, the Prophet's camel by the name of Al-Qaswa, it stopped. It stayed standing. The Sahaba, they tried to make it go forward by, by calling out Hal Hal, which means move on, go forth. Yet the camel stayed still. It did not move. So the Sahaba said, verily Qaswa has become stubborn. And you know the camels become very stubborn. Camels have a personality of their own. And anyone that deals with camels know this. That camel can become very stubborn. So the Sahaba said, Qaswa has become stubborn. The Prophet ﷺ replied, She is not stubborn, and neither is that in her nature. Rather, the one who stopped the elephants has now stopped her as well. Here, look at the detailed knowledge which has been preserved about our Prophet ﷺ. Not only do we know everything we need to know about him, we also don't know the names of his animals, Qaswat. The Sahaba preserved this for us. Every minute detail. Details that we need and we don't need. Details that increase our iman and we need to know them for our sharia and aqidah. And details that don't affect our sharia and aqidah. But everything has been preserved to the smallest detail. Even the names of the Prophet's camel, the Prophet's mule, the Prophet's donkey, the Prophet's sword. Everything has been preserved in this religion of Islam. Another benefit here is look at the mistake of jumping to conclusions. Hasty conclusions. The Sahaba immediately said, Qaswa has become stubborn. And this shows you that they were hasty. And this shows you the evils of jumping to conclusions without any evidence. Yet another benefit is that the Prophet ﷺ responded and defended the honor of a camel. He defended the honor of a camel even though the camel does not have any honor. And he said, she has not become stubborn. And neither is that in her nature. So by Allah... If the honor of a camel is worthy of being defended, then how about the honor of your fellow Muslim brother? Yet another benefit that we derive is the legitimacy, the good deeds of correcting a mistake that has occurred. The Sahaba fell into a mistake and the Prophet ﷺ corrected that mistake for them. Also we find in this hadith the incident, in this narration we find, that the incident of the elephants has been mentioned. 
And this has also been mentioned in the Quran. That when the army of Abraha came out with the elephants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped them. So look at the Prophet's eloquence here. He says the one who stopped the elephants has now stopped the camel. Beauty and eloquence at its peak. Both of them were animals. Both of them were stopped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said that the one who stopped the elephants has now stopped the camel, meaning that this is a divine inspiration. In the fact that Allah is the one who has decided where we will stop. So he lowered the camel and he sat down uh, and he camped at that ground of Hudaybiyyah. And he said, by him in whose hands is my soul, he swore by Allah, they, the mushrikun, will not ask me anything by which the signs of Allah will be shown respect and honor, except that I will give it to him. Except that I will obey them in whatever they say. In other words, whatever they ask me, as long as the sha'a'ir, the signs of Allah, the religion of Allah, as long as these are shown honor, nothing is, yani no blasphemy occurs. No evil occurs against Allah, against the Messenger, against the Kaaba, against the sacred months, against the pilgrims. Whatever they want, I will do it for them. Here, look at the modesty and the humility of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, look at his foresight and his wisdom. They are not in a position to fight. They don't have swords. What are they going to do? They don't have fighting weapons. They don't have horses like the mushrikun will have. They don't have armor. So he has the foresight and the humility and the wisdom and the military genius to openly acknowledge that whatever they do, whatever tactic or whatever conditions that they wish to put on me, I will agree to these conditions as long as the signs of Allah are shown respect. And look also, the Prophet ﷺ will not compromise his religion. He will not compromise the deen as long as the signs of Allah are shown respect. So the people encamped at that location called al hudaybiyyah And there was a small pool of water from which the people would drink. The Hudaybiyyah was not a yani, fertile land. It, was, it just had a small amount of water. And after a short time, the water had almost dried up. So they complained to the Prophet ﷺ that they don't have any water. He took a, an arrow out of the quiver that he had and he gave it to them and he said, throw it in the water. And when they threw it in the water, the water sprouted forth from that pond and they drank and they washed and they did wudu in it until they left Hudaybiyyah. And this is one of the many, many, many miracles that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was blessed with. At this point in time, one of the one of the people by the name of Budayl ibn ibn al Warqa al Khuzai, from the tribe of from the tribe of Khuzai, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said, "I have left Kaab ibn Lu'ay, one of the mushrikun, the leaders of the mushrikun. I have left him. He's coming from the direction of Mecca. I have left Kaab ibn Lu'ay on the other side of the water of Hudaybiyah." The other side, behind the mountain, just right over there. I have left him there. And they have a group of armed men with them. They will fight you and try to prevent you from entering Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ said, We have not come to fight. We are not coming here now for jihad. Rather, we have come to perform the Umrah. Indeed, war has damaged the Quraysh. And they have been hurt by it. He is reminding them of the past experiences. The battle of Badr, the battle of the Ahzab, the other battles that have occurred. The mushrikun were damaged by these battles. So he's saying, right now we don't have the time, nor do we have the energy, nor is there any reason to fight. We are not coming to fight. Rather, we are coming to perform the Umrah. If they wish, I can give them some time so that they can leave the city and allow us to do Umrah. But if they prevent me, if they refuse, then by him in whose hands is my soul, I will fight them upon this matter until the will of Allah is decided. Here, look at the Prophet's firmness, yet leniency. He is trying to convince the mushrikun through Budayla bin Warqa that I have not come to fight. And he's reminding them of the past. What is the use of fighting now? We haven't come to fight, we've come for the Umrah. Yet he shows his firmness, his determination, his resoluteness. If they are going to fight me, then I will fight them back and the will of Allah will be decided on this battlefield. Here the, the scholars of history differ. Was Budayl ibn Warqa a Muslim at this time or was he a Kafir? He accepted Islam without a doubt later on. But at this point in time, was he a Muslim or not? Most of the ulama say he was not a Muslim. And if this is the case, then this shows you the permissibility of using non-Muslims to help you 
even in matters of war, as long as you have the upper hand and you have control over them. Because Bulayr ibn Walqa was now going to become an envoy to the Quraysh. And as most of the, of the scholars of, of, of history say, at this point in time, he was not a Muslim. Rather, later on, he accepted Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ used him because he was a trustworthy person, and he knew him to be trustworthy. So Bulayr ibn Walqa came back to the Quraysh. And he said, I have spoken to this man, meaning Muhammad. And I have heard him say something. Now remember, Budayl is not from the Quraysh. He will not be given permission to speak at the gathering. So he must ask for permission. So he says, I have heard him say something. So if you wish to hear it, I will repeat it for you. In other words, he is being polite and gentle. That if you wish to hear what the Prophet ﷺ told me, give me permission and I will speak. The ignorant amongst them said, you don't have to tell us anything about him. We don't have to hear anything about him. We don't want to hear about the Prophet ﷺ. But the wise men amongst them, the intelligent ones amongst them said, Tell us what he has to say. So Budayl informed them of the Prophet's proposition ﷺ, that he had not come to fight, he wants to do Umrah. Here we find that it is always the ignorant, the stubborn people, who refuse to hear anything. They are going to blindly follow their culture, their society. Whatever they hear the people say, that's good enough for me. But the intelligent people, they are the ones who will have an open mind. Well, let's hear what he has to say. What will we lose by hearing him? What will we lose if he gives us his proposition? And this is the way to this day. The ignorant one, the stubborn people, they are the ones who put their fingers in their ears. We will not hear anything else. Whatever we hear from so-and-so, or from this society and culture, or from so-and-so person, that is sufficient for me. And I have closed my ears to everything else. But the wise man, he opens his ears. He opens his heart to the Quran and Sunnah. Let us see what the people are saying. If it is intelligent, we will take it. If it is correct and in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah, we will take it. And if it goes against the Qur'an and Sunnah, we will reject it. So Budayl, at this point in time, he gave them the proposition of the Prophet wasallam. At this, Urwa ibn Mas'ud stood up, one of the people of the Quraysh. And he had become of the Quraysh. He was not originally of the Quraysh. He became of the Quraysh and the Quraysh took him as one of their own. And he reminded them of his status amongst them. And he then said, Verily, this person has brought you a very good plan. So accept it and let me go to Muhammad وسلم, to negotiate with him. So they agreed. Urwa then went to the Prophet وسلم, outside of Hudaybiyah. And the Prophet وسلم, told him the same things he told Budayl before. That I have not come to fight. I just want to do Umrah. Let us do Umrah. You want to leave the city? We'll give you time to prepare. And you can leave the city. Let us do Umrah and we will then leave from the city. Urwa responded, O Muhammad وسلم, if you were to remove the matter of your people have you ever heard of any Arab who has destroyed his family before you? And if you go to war, then I see around me faces that are not known to me. In other words, he is saying that you have done a great damage to your society and culture. No Arab before you has divided his people like you have divided them. You are now going to come and fight us? What Arab before you has done this? You are our Yani our son, meaning that you are from Quraysh, you are our brother, you are one of us. So he's reminding him of the jahiliya that they used to be in. Where the tribe, where the nationality, where the ethnicity is the most important thing. And then he says, I see around you a hodgepodge, a collection of different people. Why? Because they were not of one qabila, they were not of one nation. The Muslims were of different nations. There was Bilal al-Farsi. Uh, Bilal al-Habashi, Salman al-Farsi, there was Suhaib al-Rumi, there were the Muhajirun, and the Muhajirun were various tribes amongst themselves. There were the Ansar, and the Ansar were also of various tribes. So, Urwa has never seen a collection like this. Because before, everyone fights based upon nationality. Everyone fights based upon Asabiyyah, Jahiliyyah. If you're from this tribe, you will fight. And if you're not, you're not going to fight. So Urwa says, if you do go to war, if this will not stop you, and you do go to war, I see around me a collection of different people. In other words, there's nothing in common between them. Remember, he's looking at it from his jahili perspective, his jahili eyes. People who, if you go to war, they will run away from you and leave you all alone to face your death. At this, Abu Bakr was standing in front of him. And he gave him a very vile, a very vulgar actually, curse. A very vulgar curse. To which Urwa responded, Who is that? Who said that? The Sahaba said, That is Abu Bakr. Urwa said, 
were it not for a favor that you did to me and I still have not repaid it back, I would have responded to your curse. Now this shows you that Abu Bakr, this shows you the Iman of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that he could not bear to hear this taunt at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this ridicule of him and of the Sahaba, that if you go to war, all of the Sahaba will leave you and you will be left to your death. This also shows you that at certain times and at certain occasions such as this one, such as this where the situation is so tense, it is allowed to use such type of vulgar words when the message will be given. And this is not something we do, obviously this is one of the signs of the hypocrite to use vulgarity and, and curses all the time. But at certain times, and Abu Bakr is the last person you would think would use uh, yani vulgar language. Abu Bakr is the last person you would ever think. But at this point in time, when this kafir mushrik has insulted the Muslims in such a manner. Abu Bakr got angry and he said a word, a vile curse word, to this man, showing you that in certain situations, in certain occasions, it is allowed to use this type of terminology when the enemy is going to be frightened. When the enemy of Islam, the adu of Islam, he will become scared of you. At this point, the uh, Urwa continued to talk with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and every time he would talk, he would hold on to the Prophet's beard like this. This was the custom of the Arabs that when you're talking to someone, you just go like this and you pull it, and he would then pull your beard back, just like a type of cultural thing. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not say anything. Whenever he would reach out to hold the Prophet's beard, Mughira ibn Shu'bah, who was standing next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, would put his hand and he would slap it on the scabbard of his sword. In other words, threatening to sh chop his hand off. Every time his hand would go out, he would put his hand and put it strongly on the handle of his sword, which was still inside the scabbard. Until when he kept on doing it and he didn't get the hint, Mughira ibn Shu'ba said, Get your hand away from the beard of the Prophet ﷺ. Don't dare to touch his beard. Who are you to touch his beard? So Urwa said, who is that? Who is speaking? He said, Mughira ibn Shu'ba. So he responded to him, O oh, traitor, are you not so eager to continue in your deceit? What had occurred was that uh, Mughira ibn Shu'ba, in his jahili days, before he, had, before he had accepted Islam, he had gone forth with a caravan. He had asked for their help and protection, and then he had gone forth with them. And when he received their protection, he then killed all of them and stole their money. And then, after a little while, he then accepted Islam and migrated to Medina. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard of this in Medina, he said, as for your Islam, I will accept it. But as for this money, I cannot accept it of you. Because you have obviously obtained it through haram. So, Urwa is reminding him of his deceit. And he's claiming that you are still eager to deceive. You are still eager to remain in this evil character that you are. Of course, forgetting and not taking into account that that was in his jahili days. And now as a Muslim, as a mu'min, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen him and had raised him to very high heights. This also shows you that the money and property of the mushrik, the kafir, is not allowed for the Muslim unless there is a jihad going on. Here, Mughira ibn Shu'ba took that money. But when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I cannot take that money from you. This money is haram for me. So while we are living in this country, it is not allowed for us to steal or to take through evil ways the money or worse than this, the life or the property of the non-Muslims here. Rather, this too has a sacredness to it. It is not allowed to do this. So Urwa, while he's continuing to talk, he begins to look around him, seeing the 1,400 companions. Now realize, none of the mushrikun have had a chance to really interact with the Prophet ﷺ on a peaceful way as of yet. Because the, the battles have gone forth before this. This is one of the first times that the mushrikun are getting a glimpse at the way the Prophet ﷺ is treating the, uh, the Sahaba and the Sahaba are treating him. And when he came back, he then narrated, he said, Wallahi, he is seeing the relationship between the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ did not spit except that the Sahaba would catch it in their hands, it wouldn't touch the ground. And, when he commanded them to do something, they would race one another, they would compete with one another, 
to see who would be the first one to do what the Prophet ﷺ said. And when he performed wudu, they would fight amongst themselves to get the water falling from his wudu, so much so that the water that fell would not touch the sand. Because the Sahaba would all catch it amongst them. And when he spoke, they all lowered their voices in front of him. And they would never raise their head up to look directly at him. This is a rare glimpse that we have of the relationship of the Sahaba to the Prophet ﷺ. The Sahaba did not narrate this to us. That would be boastful on their part. We did this, we did that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that this person, Al-Mughira ibn Shu'ba, uh, excuse me, Urwa, narrate to us the relationship that the Sahaba had with the Prophet ﷺ. He would not spit except that that spit would not fall on the ground. They would catch it and they would rub it for barakah on their bodies and face. He would not do wudu, except they would fight one another. The word he used, kadu yaqtatilun. They would fight one another to get that wudu. And not a single drop would, would fall on the ground. And when he commanded them to do something, they would race one another to see which one was the first that could do that command. And they would never raise their voice in front of him. Rather, they would not even raise their heads and look at him directly. A rare glimpse of the respect and the esteem that the Sahaba had for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because of this, when he came back and he narrated this, he said, "O Mushrikun, well, he didn't say Mushrikun. O Quraysh, O Quraysh, I have been an envoy. I have been an emissary, and I have been sent to the leaders of Rome, and the leaders of Persia, and the leaders of Abyssinia. In other words, I have seen the greatest leaders of my time. You know that there were three mighty powers." during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the Romans, the Persians, and the Abyssinians. So, Urwa is saying, I have gone to all three of them. I have entered into their palaces, and I have sat with them. And he said, by Allah, I have never seen any king being shown more respect, the like of which the companions showed the Prophet ﷺ respect. So he is testifying to the love and devotion that the Sahaba had. And this is, like I said, a rare glimpse that we get to the relationship that they had to the Prophet ﷺ. So basically, Urwa went back and nothing was solidified. Nothing had been concluded. They did not get anywhere. So one of the men of Banu Kinana, of the tribe of Banu Kinana, said, let me go talk to him. So they gave him permission. When the Muslims saw him coming, the Prophet ﷺ said, this is so and so. He mentioned his name. And he is from a tribe they show respect to the sac sacrificial animals. Now you have to remember that Hajj and Umrah, there are animals that you take to be sacrificed. And these animals, still it is Sunnah to this day, unfortunately it's not a too common Sunnah, it is not practiced, they are decorated in a certain way. That when you look at them, you realize that these animals have been set aside for sacrifice. And certain fiqhi rulings apply. You cannot yani, ride upon them, you cannot do various things to them. There are certain fiqhi rulings that apply to these animals as well. And this custom was known since the time of Ibrahim. Therefore the Jahili Arabs also practiced it. That they would decorate the camels, they would garland them, put various flowers and various things on them. So that they, the people would know that this camel and this animal has been set aside for sacrifice. So the Prophet is saying, this person is from a tribe, they respect the sacrificial animal. They are awed by it. So bring forth all of the animals to show to him. So when he came, all of the Sahaba brought forth their animals decorated like this. And he heard the cries of Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, which is the cries of Talbiya. And he was deeply affected by this. Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, O oh Allah, I answer your call. I am here, I answer your call. This is what a person says during Hajj. So when he came back to the Quraysh, he said, Subhanallah. He said, Subhanallah. It is not proper that these people be prevented from coming to the house of Allah. I have seen their animals ready for sacrifice and decorated. And I don't think it is right. I don't think it is fair that they be stopped from entering. Once again, look at the wisdom of the Prophet wasallam, And so too, we should be when we give da'wah. We look at the person we're giving da'wah to. We look at where he's coming from. We look at what he likes, what he is attracted to. If he is attracted to good akhlaq, good conduct, we show him that side of Islam. If he is attracted to being good to one's parents, we show him that side of Islam. Whatever he is attracted to, and it is from the fitrah, then we will find it in Islam. So we use that, obviously along with Tawheed. 
We use that to make him closer to Islam. Just like the Prophet ﷺ did. So this is a part of the wisdom of the da'i. That he understands the one he's giving da'wah to. He knows his mentality and he gives him da'wah accordingly. So at this point in time, it's, it's as if there's a stalemate. Nothing is going on. So the Prophet ﷺ decides to send an envoy. So he says to Umar, go to the Quraysh and tell them what we want to do. Tell them the plan. Umar radiallahu an said, I fear that the Quraysh might not accept me, as my enmity to them is well known. And neither is there anyone from amongst the tribe of Adi ibn Ka'b, his own tribe, to protect me. Therefore I advise that you send Uthman ibn Affan, they respect him more than I do. Here, look at the wisdom of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. And this shows you that it is allowed to give a suggestion to the leader. Even though, of course, if the Prophet ﷺ had commanded him, he would have done it. But he is thinking that there's something more wiser than himself. And Umar is not a coward as we know. He is not scared. But for the benefit of Islam, for the glory of Islam, he sacrifices his own ego. And he says, I think Uthman would do a better job than I would do. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Uthman ibn Affan to the Quraysh. And when he went there, he gathered together. When he entered Mecca, one of his relatives came forth and said that I will protect you. Because Uthman ibn Affan was from a very famous tribe and said, I will protect you, do not worry, you will go anywhere you want with me. So they went around and they gathered the leaders of the Quraysh and Uthman proposed for them the plan that the Prophet ﷺ had, let us do Umrah, go outside of the city and we will then go back and go back to Medina, no harm being done. So they said, let us think about it, but in the meantime, you can do Tawaf if you want and Umrah, we'll let you do it. Uthman. Since you've already come here into Mecca, you might as well do it and then go back and let us give us some time to think. Uthman said, by Allah, I will never do tawaf while the Prophet ﷺ has not yet done it. How can I do tawaf and the Prophet ﷺ is outside the city? I will not do it. Now while this is going on, you can imagine that it took a very long time for them to yani, gather uh, the people of the Quraysh and gather the, the tribe leader and to have this meeting. So in the meantime, a rumor spread that Uthman had been killed. When the news came to the Prophet ﷺ of this rumor, he said, We will not leave here until we have taken our revenge upon the Quraysh. If this is true, we are going to fight them. We will not leave, we will not let the blood of Uthman have been spilled for no reason. So then he took an oath of allegiance. Every single companion came forth and gave him an oath that they will fight and not turn back. They will fight people who are coming from their houses well rested, fully armed, armored everything to the, to the hilt as they say. Every single horse fresh, every single camel ready for them. Their swords drawn, their spears sharpened. And the Muslims, defenseless. Nothing but two white sheets on them. Not a single piece of armor on them. Nothing but traveling swords, not even fighting swords with them. Every single one of the 1,400 Sahaba came forth, put his hand in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, and swore by Allah that of a surety he would fight and not turn his back to the enemy. Except for one munafiq, one munafiq, who out of embarrassment that he could not be seen, he hid behind a camel. Yet all of the Sahaba saw him, and his name is recorded in history. But the rest of the Sahaba, they took the oath of allegiance. And this shows you the status of the Sahaba. This shows you their iman. This shows you their tawakkul in Allah. Imagine the situation. And it is difficult to imagine. And yet every single one of them gave forth his right hand and put it in the right hand of the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet ﷺ had finished all of the 1,400 Sahaba, there's one person left, Uthman ibn Affan. So he takes his own left hand and he puts it in his own right hand and he says, this is on behalf of Uthman. Had Uthman been here, I know that he would have given this oath. What greater testimony do you need? What greater tazkiyah? What greater letter of recommendation do you need when the Prophet ﷺ himself swears on behalf of Uthman? And this is one of the greatest honors and blessings of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala Know, O Muslim brothers and sisters, that those people that gave the oath of allegiance, the Bay'at al-Ridwan as it became known, the Bay'at al-Ridwan, 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting under a tree, and all one thousand four hundred of the companions came and gave bayah. Those companions occupy a very high status, second only to one group. Those Sahaba that participated at Badr, they are higher than them. The highest group of companions are those companions that participated in Badr. After them, and of course the Badr the Badriyun were around three hundred and fifteen. After them. The second highest level of companions are those that witnessed the Bay'atul Ridwan. Because the Prophet ﷺ looked at them after that and he said, You are the best people on the face of this earth today. Khayru Ahlil Ard. So the Bay'atul Ridwan, those Sahaba that took it, they are the best of the Sahaba after those that participated in the Battle of Badr. And of course, most of those that participated in the Battle of Badr also participated, if they were alive, at the battle or in the Bay'at of Ridwan. Now Uthman ibn Affan came back and the Muslims confirmed that this was just a rumor. So once again look at the uh, effects that rumors can have. And يعني, uh, obviously in this case the effect was good and bad. Uh, and the good was that the Sahaba showed their Iman. Uh, and also the good came out of it was that uh, the Munafiq was exposed and shown. And also the evil that came out of it, the, the fear that obviously would have come to the Sahaba. But still their Iman overcame that fear of theirs and they gave the Bayat of Ridwan. Then the Quraysh sent another man, and that too did not uh, work out. And while the Prophet ﷺ was talking to this man, the final person came, Suhail ibn Amr. When the Prophet ﷺ saw Suhail ibn Amr, he became happy. And he said, his name was Suhail, he said, قَدْ سَهُولَ أَمْرُكُمْ A name with a play with words. He said, your matter has become easy, Sahula. Suhail means the easy one. So the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ سَهُولَ أَمْرُكُمْ This shows you the permissibility, in fact, the... Uh, yani, the part of one's iman is to be optimistic, to think the best of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, it is allowed to be optimistic through names. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be, use optimism. When he heard a good name, it would cheer him up, it would make him happy. So when Suhail came, he said, قَدْ سَهُلَ أَمْرُكُمْ That your affair has been made easy for you. So it appears that the mushrikun had finally come together and they decided what to do in the meantime. So they sent Suhail with the conditions that they wanted. So Suhail said to the Prophet ﷺ, Come, let us write a treaty between us. Let's get this over with. Come forth and we will put some conditions down, both of us. So the Prophet ﷺ called for a scribe, which was Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Prophet ﷺ started dictating, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And of course this shows you the sunnah, which is the sunnah of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah to start everything of, of importance with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That is why Allah started the Qur'an with it, the first verse of Surah Fatiha. He started every single surah with it except for Surah Tawbah. Likewise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would start all of his letters with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this, Suhail said, As for ar-Rahman, I don't know who he is. Remember ar-Rahman, the Mushikun used to deny this name. He said, as for Ar-Rahman, I don't know who he is. Rather, let us write down, Bismik Allahum, like we used to do before, yani, this religion of yours. So the Prophet wasallam, the Muslims, when they heard this, they said, we will not write it except as Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. But the Prophet wasallam said, no, Bismik Allahum. Because the meaning is correct, there's nothing wrong here. Once again, look at the foresight. Bismik Allahum means, in your name, O Allah. So look at the foresight of the Prophet ﷺ. Look at the humility. Look at the wisdom. We will not lose anything by writing something Bismik Allahum. It, it too is correct. And look once again at the Muslims. Perhaps a bit immature if you like. No, we will do it. We will have it this way. Yet the Prophet ﷺ is more mature than them. So he said we will write it Bismik Allahum. Then he continued. This is what Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ has agreed to with Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail stopped him. He said, O Muhammad, if we knew that you were Rasulullah, we would not fight you. We would not have fought you. Nor would we be in this situation that we are in now. We don't believe you are Rasulullah. Cross out Rasulullah. Write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That is who you are. At this, the Prophet wasallam said, Wallahi, by Allah, I am the Prophet of Allah, even if you disbelieve in me. Erase it and write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I am not going to erase it. You are Muhammad Rasulullah, and if they don't believe it, that's their problem. So the Prophet ﷺ took the piece of paper from him, and he asked him where it said Rasulullah, and he himself crossed out Rasulullah with his hand. Look at the wisdom, the humility 
of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look at the condition. What did he say when they camped at Hudaybiyah? They are not going to ask me anything by which the signs of Allah are shown respect except that I will give it to them. He is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. It is not a lie. Therefore, let us write Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if the mushrikun don't want to do it. Here, look at the love of Ali for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and look at the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that certain matters might not be the best it might appear that there could be something better than that. But the Muslim sometimes has to do it. The Muslim sometimes has to do things for a greater benefit than what can be seen. Think long term instead of short term. And this is what the main, one of the main themes of Hudaybiyyah. So the Prophet ﷺ continued, You will leave us to perform Umrah. He is now writing the conditions down. Let us do the Umrah. So he stopped him and said, No, let not the Arabs say that we were forced into something that we didn't want to do. Rather, we will leave you to do Umrah next year. You have come. If you were to do Umrah this year, we would lose faith. It would appear that you have become the victors over us. And we have our reputation to uphold. Therefore, let not the Arabs say, look at his jahiliyyah. All they can think of is what the people will think of them. Let not the Arabs say that we were taken by force. You were the victors. No, rather that will be next year. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed. Tayyib, it will be next year. And then Suhail gave the condition. Here is the condition of the Prophet ﷺ. Now Suhail said, And that not a single man will come to you from us, from Mecca to Medina, even if he be upon your religion, except that you will return him to us. The Muslim said, Subhanallah, how can we return a Muslim to the mushriks while he has come to us wanting protection? While they were debating this point, they have not yet written this down. Abu Jandal, Ibn Suhail ibn Amr comes. Abu Jandal, the son of who? The same person that they're writing the treaty with. And Abu Jandal was a Muslim. He had accepted Islam. And his own father had tied him in chains inside his house. And had tortured him and whipped him and beat him because of his Islam. When he heard that the Muslims were in Hudaybiyyah, he managed to escape, escape free. But the chains were still around his hands. So he ran into the Muslim camp at Hudaybiyyah. And when Suhail saw him, he said, O Muhammad, this man is the first man that must be fulfilled in this treaty. Here is the condition, this man will be the first. Obviously, this is Suhail's son here. The situation is tense. The situation is tense. The Prophet ﷺ says, we have not even written it down yet. We haven't agreed to it yet. In other words, let me take this man. He said, no, I will not let you do it. The Prophet ﷺ said, give him to me as one exception. Allow me this man, Abu Jandal. Suhail said, by Allah, if you take him, I will not agree to anything that we have said. The whole treaty is null and void. The Prophet ﷺ once again said, just do it. Bala if'al. And hardly ever has the Prophet ﷺ tried so hard in his life. Bending over backwards, as they say, to save this Muslim from the hands of the mushrikeen. But Suhail is adamant, no, I will not save him. I will not let him go to you. Remember now, this is his own son, and Allah knows best, had it been someone else, he might have allowed him. Abu Jandas cries out, O Muslims, will you allow me to return to the mushrikeen? And you see my state? And he's still tied up in chains. He has dragged himself, literally, to the army of the, to the camp of the Muslims. O oh Muslims, will you let me go back and you see the effects of torture on me? And the one narrating the hadith, he says, and the Muslims could see that he had been tortured, a severe torture. You can imagine the blood, the bruises, the wounds, still tied up in chains. At this point in time, Nikras, one of the people that was with Suhay, the one of the mushrikun, he said, O oh Muhammad, we will take him. In other words, Okay, he will be away from the father, from the house of his father. We will take him in our house, so that at least he will not be treated in this manner. We cannot give him to you. But at, so Mikras, the, the other person with Suhail, he suggested something in the middle. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Aba Jandal, be patient. For verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for you, and he will find an exit for you. Here, brothers and sisters, ponder over the Iman of Abu Jandal. 
imagine his hope reaching the camp of the Muslim army. Finally, I have been saved. Imagine the fears while this transaction, while all of this is going on, the conversation. Not only that, but the one who refuses to take him is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. He cannot take him. Rasulullah himself tells him to go back and be patient. Imagine his iman when the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself tells him to go back. Himself rejects him and says, "I cannot take you now. Be patient." And perhaps Allah will make a way and exit for you. Can you imagine this iman? When the very Prophet that you have believed in cannot take you in and tells you to go back and be patient? Wallahi, this is an iman that we cannot even conceptualize, cannot even imagine. Here, we find the eagerness of the Prophet ﷺ to save Abu Jandal. We also find that the Prophet ﷺ did something even though it didn't look good at this point in time but there is a greater benefit to sacrifice Abu Jandal one person for the benefit of the whole army the whole Muslim army and this is what you call maturity this is what you call wisdom and then they continue with the treaty and of the conditions of the treaty was that, was that there would be peace for 10 years so that there would be no fighting amongst the Muslims and the Mushriks for 10 years also that if a Muslim were to come to Mecca he would not be returned to them Rather, only if a mushrik accepted Islam and came to Medina, then he would have to be returned. Also, that next year they would be allowed three days to perform Umrah, and they would come, the, the mushrikun would leave Mecca, the Prophet would perform Umrah during that year, and then he would uh, go back to Medina. All of these conditions were put in the treaty, and Suhail left. At this, Umar ibn al-Khattab, and you can imagine Umar's blood boiling. And during the incident of Abu Jandal, he was marching, angrily, walking past Abu Janda, showing Abu Janda his sword, because he cannot release his sword or else a war will break out. But he's walking past Abu Janda, showing him his sword, trying to get Abu Janda to take it, because he cannot. It's Umar. Are you not the Prophet of Allah? The Prophet said, yes I am. He says, Ya Rasulullah, are we not upon the truth and they upon Dalala in misguidance? He said, yes they are. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, how can we accept humiliation in our religion? Now these are rhetorical questions from Umar. No one doubts that Umar did not question that the Prophet was the Messenger of Allah. Rather, this is a rhetorical question. He knows the answer. Are you not the Messenger of Allah? Yes. Are we not upon truth? Yes. Are they not upon evil? Yes. Then why can we accept humiliation in this religion? So the Prophet said, Verily, I am the Messenger of Allah and I will not disobey him. I will not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will help me. Umar tries one last time. Ya Rasulullah, did you not tell us we will do Umrah? Did you not tell us that we will shave our heads and do tawaf? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, yes I did. But did I tell you that it will be this year? He said, no. So the Prophet sallallahu said, then you will do it of a surety, but not this year. So Umar went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went to Abu Bakr still angry, and asked him the same questions. Ya Abu Bakr, is he not the messenger of Allah? Is he not upon the truth? Are they not upon the batil? Then how can we be humiliated in our religion? How can we accept the lower hand? Abu Bakr responded, Ya Rajul, O man! Now he can be strict with Umar. And Abu Bakr is the only person that can be strict with Umar. O man! He is the messenger of Allah. And Allah will not let him go astray. Therefore hold on to the stirrup of his saddle. Look at, he's putting Umar in his place. Hold on to the stirrup of his saddle and don't let go of that. Know your status, Ya Umar. So Umar said, and he is the one narrating this particular incident, he said, فَفَعَلْتُ لِذَلِكَ أَعْمَالًا I did many good deeds to make up what I had done. And some of the tabi'un, they say he freed so many slaves, and he fasted so many days, and he prayed so many nights, because his anger got the better of him, and he did something that he should not have done because of his love for Islam. But he fell into a mistake, nonetheless. So he said that, I did for that many good deeds to make up for that. So now the Prophet ﷺ stood up, and he said, shave your heads off. This is it. We're not doing Umrah this year. We have to go back now. The journey from Medina to Mecca, does not last three hours as it does in our times. 
Rather, it lasts two to three long, grueling, hot weeks. Walking in the sun, bare sandals. They have come all the way, eager, enthusiastic. They have not seen Mecca for six years. They have not seen their homeland since they have left it. They want to go back. They want to do Umrah. So when the Prophet ﷺ tells them to shave their hair off, not a single person moves. The same group whom Urwa said when the Prophet ﷺ commanded them to do something, they would race one another in order to see who was the first to do it. This same group, they are shocked. That's it. We will not do Umrah this year. None of them moved. The Prophet ﷺ, second time, asked them. No response. Third time, no response. And you can imagine the Sahaba are shocked. They are really, literally in a state of shock. They cannot move. We will now leave nothing, having performed nothing. So the Prophet ﷺ entered into his wife, Umm Salama, and he told her what was happening. And Umm Salama said, Ya Rasulullah, do you want the Sahaba to follow you? Do you want them to obey you? Then listen to me. Go outside. Don't say anything. And have your own hair shaven. And sacrifice your own animals in front of their eyes. Do this and you will see. So the Prophet ﷺ followed the advice of Umm Salama, which shows you the status of women in Islam. We take their advice. He was not embarrassed to take comfort and solace in his wife. He was not embarrassed to confide in her. And he was not embarrassed to follow up her advice. He took it. So when he went outside, he did not speak to anyone. Rather, he had his hair shaved off and he sacrificed his animals. When the Sahaba saw him do that, all of them stood up. Every one of them. And they started racing one another. Who of them would be the first to sacrifice their animals? And who of them would be able to shave off the hair of everyone else? So much so that the one narrating this incident, he said they almost killed each other in their shaving. And anyone that's done Hajj knows what's being referred to here. When at Mina, when you start shaving the hairs off, everyone becomes a barber. Then you see uh, what he is referring to. They almost kill themselves shaving the hair off. In other words, the Sahaba did have iman. So when they saw the Prophet ﷺ do it, that immediately affected them. It jolted them. When they saw the Prophet do it, they themselves did it. So they went forth and they obeyed the Prophet ﷺ. On the return trip to Medina. On the return trip to Medina, some of the women came to the army from Mecca. Some of the women believers, the women Muslims, the Muslimat, they came seeking protection. The Muslims were confused what to do. Because the treaty says that any man comes to you, return him. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina that when women believers come to you, test them. If you find them upon Iman, then do not send them back to the mushrikeen. And here look, subhanallah, the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty of Allah's plans. The treaty said, no man will come to you except that you will return him to us. Now of course it is understood that when you say man, woman is included in it. But here it is, we are shown that it is allowed to use these type of halal tricks, permissible tricks. The treaty says man, it doesn't say woman. So Allah said, any woman comes to you, keep them. And this is the beauty. As for the man, he might be able to bear the torture, the punishment. But the woman, no. She is the gentle one. She is the softer of the two sexes. So Islam allowed a way out for them by a way that the mushriks did not realize. So they were allowed to uh, go with the Muslims and they were divorced from their prophet husbands and the Muslims were allowed to marry them after their waiting period had uh, finished. Now on their way back to Medina, Umar felt greatly troubled by what he had done. He felt extremely guilty. So he went up on his camel to the Prophet ﷺ and he tried to start a neutral conversation, trying to see if the Prophet ﷺ was angry with him or not. But the Prophet ﷺ did not respond back to him. He tried a second time and the Prophet ﷺ did not respond. He tried a third time and there was no response. So Umar went back and he said to himself, Let Umar's mother now mourn the loss of her son. Let Umar's mother now be sad that she has lost her son. In other words, I have been destroyed. There is no hope for me. He didn't realize that the Prophet ﷺ was being inspired by Allah. Wahi was coming down. Therefore, when Umar saw this, he thought that the Wahi was coming down because of him. 
Very soon, a crier came out. Ya Umar, the Prophet is calling you. His heart went to death. This verse has now been revealed for me. So he came slowly up to the Prophet And he saw the Prophet smiling like the full moon. The Sahaba said when the Prophet would smile, he would be like the full moon or brighter than that. He saw the teeth of the Prophet a bright smile. And he said, Ya Umar, verily Allah has revealed verses to me. They are more beloved to me than this whole dunya and all that it contains. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have given you a great victory. The great conquest has come. Umar said, Is this a victory, Ya Rasulullah? This is a victory that has what has occurred to us? He said, Yes, Ya Umar. So Umar says, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And he goes back spreading to the Sahaba. This is a victory. It's not a loss. Inna fatahna laka mubina. We have given you a great victory. Look at the Iman of Umar. Now here the Shi'as, la'anahumullah. They try to use this incident to try to attack Umar. Look at the Iman of Umar. All he wanted was the Wahi. Tell me that this is a victory, that's all I need. And when the Wahi comes, look at how happy he is. He doesn't understand how it's a victory. He doesn't see it how. But the fact that Allah tells him it's a victory, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna fatahna laka fatah mubina, that's all he has to hear. So he goes back shouting amongst the Muslims, the victory has occurred. Inna fatahna laka fatah mubina. And Surah Al-Fatah came down, which of course talks about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and the incident of uh, the Sahaba giving bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will take a break for the adhan and then continue inshallah for another 10 minutes in the story. The Prophet returned to Medina. A Muslim who had converted in Mecca, he managed to escape and come to Medina by the name of Abu Basir. His name was Abu Basir. Obviously when he ran away, the mushrikun sent behind him two people to bring him back. So they entered upon the Prophet ﷺ and they said, we have a treaty between us. Give us back Abu Basir. So the Prophet ﷺ handed him back, handed them back Abu Basir without any questions. It shows you the honesty of the Prophet ﷺ. It shows you that when he's given his word, he will live up to it. He handed them back to Abu Basir. So the man took him, the two men took Abu Basir and they started walking with him back to uh, Mecca. And they stopped for their lunch at a place called Dhul Hulayfa, which is also the Miqat. So while they were eating their lunch, Abu Basir said to one of them, Verily, your sword looks very impressive to me. You have a mighty and fine sword with you. So the other man, he fell into the trap. And he said, Yes, indeed, it is a great sword. And I have done this and this in such and such a battle. And I have done this and this in such and such a battle. And Abu Basir extracted out more information about the sword. And he's got him very proud of the sword. He says, oh so and so, by Allah, let me just touch it. Let me just touch this sword, this grand magical sword of yours. So the fool hands him the sword. Immediately Abu Basir takes it out, chops his head off. The other man when he sees this, he stands up and runs away. So Abu Basir walks back with the sword in hand, gently to the Prophet ﷺ. But obviously the mushrik has preceded him because he's running all the way back to Medina. Look at this mushrik, he runs back to Medina seeking protection in the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He enters the masjid, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees him, he says, Verily, this man has seen something very frightening, you can tell by his expression. Uh, tayyib, so inshallah we'll break for prayer and then we'll continue right after prayer. There's only around 10 minutes left inshallah. Uh, the brothers want to pray now. Uh, so we'll pray and then we'll continue after the prayer. Then inshallah we'll also take questions and answers. Just 10 minutes left inshallah. Inshallah, we'll pray. Uh, we'll, we'll pray the fard prayer, and then immediately after the fard prayer, we'll continue.
with the talk and then the sunnah can be uh, performed after the talk inshallah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala So after the return of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to uh, Medina the incident of Abu Basir occurred where Abu Basir uh, came back accepting Islam to Medina and uh, the Quraysh sent two people to bring Abu Basir back with them as per the treaty so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed to that and Abu Basir through his ingenuity and his courage and bravery he managed to kill one of them and the other one fled back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he entered the masjid and when he entered the masjid the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this person has indeed seen something very frightening so when he came in he started screaming O oh Muhammad, my companion has been killed and I'm about to die as well. My companion has been killed and I too am about to die. Look, when you don't have Iman, you don't have courage. This person had no courage whatsoever. He runs back to his enemy. And what a yani, person to have as your enemy, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa How evil is this person? But he realizes that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa will be fair and just. So he turns back to him seeking protection. So look at the contradictory, and look at the, 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 the dichotomy that this is. He realizes that his own enemy will be his only protection for life. So he runs back to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O oh Muhammad, my companion has been killed and I too am about to be killed. So save me. And at that point in time, Abu Basir walks in with his sword still, red with the blood of the person he has killed. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, you have fulfilled your treaty. You have fulfilled your duties to Allah and returned me to them. But I managed to escape myself. In other words, he's trying to find a way out of the treaty. By saying that, you did return me to them. You fulfilled your treaty. Abu Basir realized why he had been returned. And this shows you the maturity in the iman of Abu Basir as well. So he's trying to say, Ya Rasulullah, you returned me to them. I escaped. Now let me live in Medina. What's the problem now? I mean, it was my own doing. But the Prophet ﷺ realized that this would go against the treaty. Even if he did return Abu Basir, uh, to the mushrikun and they and he managed to escape himself Abu Basir could not live in Medina because that would go against what the treaty said that you would not allow any person from Mecca who accepts a religion to co- go with you and stay in Medina so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said alas for his mother which is an expression in Arabic woe is his mother Mis'ab Mis'ab was Abu Basir's name Mis'ab is a very talented warrior if only he had someone to help him so, you can imagine the Prophet ﷺ is there, the emissary of the Quraysh is there, and Abu Basir is there as well. The Prophet has done his job ﷺ by handing over Abu Basir to him in the first time. The second time around, he hints to Abu Basir without saying anything explicitly. Woe to his mother. In other words, if he stays here, his mother will have something to cry over. Woe to his mother. Mis'al, Abu Basir is a very talented warrior, speaking in the third person, so as not to, again, hinting. Mis'ad is a very talented warrior. If only someone could help him. In other words, no one is here to help him. Sorry, Mis'ad, we cannot help you. So when Mis'ad heard this, he turned around and fled. Because he knew that the Prophet ﷺ, if he stayed there, he would return him to the mushrikeen. So he fled away from Medina. And it was the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't hand over forcefully as he did the first time. Because that would be going fulfilling the treaty too much. Rather, he warned Mis'ad, if you stay here, you're going to have to go back. So Mis'ad fled and he went to a place outside of Jeddah on the shores of Jeddah. Okay, there was a place there, he, he, he went there. In the meantime, Abu Janda himself, the, the same son of Suhail, Abu Janda fled Mecca again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will that he meet up with Abu Basir. So now they both stayed in that location. And he became well known that any Muslim who accepts Islam, any person who accepts Islam in Mecca, he cannot go to Medina. So where does he go? The place of Abu Basir and Abu Jandal. And so they went there. And every single time a caravan from the Quraysh passed by them, they attacked that caravan. They killed the mushrikeen and they took their money from them. Obviously you realize they have no means of survival. This is halal for them at that particular time. Because the mushrikeen have tortured them and tried to kill them. And they're refusing to let them go to Medina. What else are they going to do? So for that particular situation, guerrilla warfare, mercenaryism, whatever you want to call it, it becomes halal for them. They have no other solution. Oh mushrikun, you're torturing us, killing us, and you're not letting us go live with the Muslims. We have no other choice. So in this situation, it is allowed to do that. So they were started torturing the caravans of 
the mushrikun, they would not allow any caravan to go except that they would attack it and at least cause some damage even if they didn't uh, capture the, the caravan itself. When this continued for a period of time, Quraysh sent a delegation to Medina. And they begged, they pleaded, they begged the Prophet wasallam. They said, by the rights of Allah and by the rights that we have over you as your relative, please take in these people. Let them come to Medina. Look here, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. Look here, the infinite plan of Allah. Everything will happen. You might not understand it at first. The mushrikun themselves had to come and say, okay, forget this part of the treaty. Just ignore it. Take the Muslims in. The mushrikun themselves had to admit this. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, yani allowed the, those sahaba to come back uh, to Medina and live with them there. Taban, the story goes on and on, but basically this is the end of the general incident of Hudaybiyah. And Az-Zuhri, Imam Az-Zuhri, one of the greatest scholars at Sabi'een, he said there was no victory given to Islam before that time greater than it. Inna fatahya laka fatham mubina. It must have been a victory. He said the people were at peace with one another. So they would mix and talk about Islam. For the first time, people would actually intermingle with their enemies. The Muslims, the mushrik, the mushrik with the Muslims. The caravans with other caravans, the traders with everyone. Everyone would inter- intermingle and mix and they would be able to talk about Islam with no dangers, with no fear of any attack. So as zuhri says, there was not a single intelligent person who had heard about Islam except that he accepted it. During this period, after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So in the two years after Hudaybiyah, this is Zuhri speaking still, in the two years after Hudaybiyah, the number of Muslims doubled or even went more than that. 13 years of Mecca, plus 6 years of Hudaybiyah, 19 years, 20 years. Two years after Hudaybiyah, the number of Muslims doubled in the previous 20 years. Is this not a great victory? Is this not a manifest victory? And Ibn Hisham, the author of the famous Hira, he remarks, the greatest proof for this is that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called out for the Umrah, 1,400 Sahaba were there at the Bayat al Ridwan. And yet when he marched to Mecca less than two years later, 10,000 Sahaba were behind him. Within two years, 10,000 Sahaba, all of them willing to give their life, their soul, their property for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this, dear brothers and sisters, is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And many are the lessons and morals in it, and we've discussed some of them. But the primary theme of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is that it is possible, <coughs> it is possible that the Muslim Ummah, the Da'i, the scholar, the Imam, he might have to do something which doesn't make immediate sense. It's, it perhaps has some type of something that doesn't seem right in it, but there is a greater benefit, there is a greater maslaha. As for the Prophet ﷺ, he had the inspiration, the wahi. But the Imams, the A'imma, the scholars of this Ummah, they also have the Qur'an and Sunnah. So there are certain times and situations where they, it might be better to do something, it might not appear to be the best thing to do. To work with certain groups, to be seen with certain parties and activities, to be involved with certain people. There might be a greater benefit to be gained, even though there is some harm in there as well. Just such as in the Treaty of Qadabiyah. In other words, maturity, foresight, planning, long-term planning. We have to look at the goods the, of the Muslim Ummah as a whole. Sacrifice Abu Basir temporarily for the, for the good of the whole Muslim. Sacrifice Abu Janda temporarily because we have all of Medina to protect. There are certain sacrifices that are trivial and the fruits of those sacrifices will be good in this world and in the hereafter. But the gain that will be gotten, the overall good that will be achieved because of these sacrifices is far greater and worth the sacrifice that needs to be done. Therefore, we leave it to our ulama. We leave it to our scholars. They are the ones who guide us. They are the ones who tell us what to do, what not to do. We don't base our religion on emotions. Like the Sahaba, we will not remove Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We will not cross out Muhammad Rasulullah. We will not have this type of treaty with them. Yet the foresight, the wisdom, the intelligence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is what made the victory. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina, the victory of the treaty of Hudaybiyah. أقول قولي هذا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. Or covering the woman's face. Uh, what is the different opinions about the fuqaha? 
this is a very sensitive issue because the sisters, all of them, hold very strong opinions about it either way. And the fact of the matter is that whatever opinion a person holds, he should not make the, his opinion, in his opinion, the only opinion that is correct. In the sense that he should realize that the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah have differed about this issue. Okay, our own scholars have differed about this issue from the past to the present. There are different opinions about this issue. So if a certain brother or a sister holds one opinion, let him not look down upon someone who holds another opinion. Okay? A certain person might think that it is wajib, so he will make fun of the people or the sister that are not having it. And this is not proper. Another person might think it is mustahab, so he will make fun of those who always cover themselves as well with niqab, and this too is not proper. So if anyone holds one opinion, let him or her not look down upon the other party or the other side. Also let him not have ill feelings or bad manners. Rather, if one wants to discuss this issue, it should be based upon knowledge, it should be based upon good akhlaq, and if the other person is not uh, convinced, then fine, they have many ulama behind them. In my humble opinion, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, Okay? So I am the type that this opinion, I really admit that there is a strong ikhtilaf here. And when you read the evidence, and I would like to point out that most of those brothers and sisters, especially those that don't speak Arabic and they have not studied, they are not students of knowledge. Therefore, they have not studied the evidences directly. Rather, they have read some translations of certain things in English, and so they jump to a conclusion very adamantly and upon great emotion. But it is not proper because they have not studied the issue firsthand. As for me, I have studied this issue and Allah knows best. I am inclined towards the opinion that it is obligatory, especially upon those sisters who are young and they will be a fitna uh, to those that look at them. And one of the strongest proofs is this story right in front of you. This story right in front of you that Aisha says, he had seen me before the verses of hijab had been revealed. In other words, after the verses of hijab had been revealed, there I would cover my face. The meaning of, it, of that is that because you recognize everyone as every person knows and no one except an arrogant person will deny you recognize by the face you don't recognize by the feet you don't recognize by the hands you recognize by the face so the fact that Safwan had seen her before the ayat of the hijab why is Aisha mentioning this? she is saying the only way he would possibly have recognized me is because he had seen me before the verses of hijab and then also the next thing Immediately when he saw me and I woke up, I covered myself with my face. Explicit, uh, yani explicit things here. As for those who differentiate between the hijab of the Prophet's wife and the hijab of other Muslim women, then there is no explicit uh, thing to this effect. The Prophet's wife, la shak, without a doubt, they had to be guarded and protected more than the other uh, women, but there is no evidence to suggest that the rulings pertaining to them were any different than uh, the other Sahabiyat. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, and I will not entertain any more questions about niqab. Okay? If you have another opinion, alhamdulillah. Now I'm not the person to ask me because this is the opinion that I follow. Uh, is it permissible to spread good rumors when you're not sure if the rumor is true or not? Without a doubt, spreading rumors that have a good yani, connotation are not sinful, but still they should be verified. Okay, they should be verified before anything of this nature is spread, because it is possible that someone hears a good rumor and he takes an action based upon that, uh, and that action is turned out to be useless and futile based upon the good rumor. Allah Ta'ala A'la. If one is accused of a crime which they did not do, and even though you try to justify or prove your innocence, but justice is not done, and people treat you differently because of that crime, what should you do? Okay, so basically you are accused of something you are free of, and you are, you are accused of being guilty when you are in fact innocent. What should you do? Wallahi brothers, I am telling you honestly, and in all truth, thank Allah, thank Allah, that you are the one that is wronged, and not the one that is doing the wrong. The Prophet ﷺ said, Injustice, bun, will be darkness on the day of judgment. Thank Allah that you have not wronged anyone. Rather, people have wronged you. And if you have been wronged severely, then raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clear you of this wrong. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the one that has been wronged, that he said that the dua of the one that has been wronged, it raises up to the heavens like lightning. And the doors of the skies open up for it. And it reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says to that soul that has been wronged, لَأَنصُرَنَّكِ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ حِينَ بِعِزَّةِ وَجَلَالِ لَأَنصُرَنَّكِ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ حِينَ By my honor and glory, I will respond to your dua. I will help you, even if it's after some time. So pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He uh, make you innocent and free you of the guilt that you have been accused of. And make sure 
that you do not fall into dhulm when people have done dhulm to you. You do not do injustice when people have done injustice to you. Be patient and realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed uh, will indeed يعني, reward you for your patience and give you the ajr for what you have been accused of, that which is not true. Is backbiting against children a sin? Uh, the children are not mukallaf, they are not responsible. Therefore, backbiting about them does not carry the weight that says about someone who has reached puberty. However, at the same time, it is not something that should be done for no reason. For example, parents can talk about the children. There is no doubt they are the ones who are in charge of uh, them. The mother might tell the father something uh, that has occurred and some discipline needs to be taken. Children have not reached the age of, 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 of technique for being responsible for their actions. Therefore, uh, if there is a reason to, like for example, amongst the parents or something, then this is justified and there is no uh, any problem there, inshallah. Yes, a good question. Can a Muslim fall into the trap of hypocrisy without knowing? And what would the sign and what, when would they be called a munafa? Jazakallah. Very good question. We have to differentiate between two types of nifaq, two types of hypocrisy. There is the nifaq in which a person actually is a hypocrite. In the sense he proclaims to be a Muslim, but in his heart he doesn't believe in Allah and his Muslim. In his heart he really does not believe in Islam. And this is the nifaq al-aqadi, the nifaq of one's aqidah. This is the worst half of nifaq concerning which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ The munafiqeen will be in the lowest depths of the fire of hell. This is the type of nifaq which only occurs amongst those who know that they are not Muslims, they are only pretending to be Muslims. But there is another type of nifaq which is known as uh, the nifaq of actions. Okay? The nifaq of actions. In this case, a person will not reach that low level of nifaq, that is the nifaq of the aqidah, but he might have certain characteristics, certain attributes that the munafiq won't face. So he will not be a pure munafiq, he will not be a kafir outside the fold of Islam, but he will be, he will be guilty of practicing certain acts of the munafiq. And of these acts, we have mentioned in the hadith, and for example, in this thing is to spread lies and tales and rumors. And also, the Prophet says, there are four things, when a person does them, he will be a pure hypocrite. But when he does some of them, he will have some of the characteristics of hypocrisy. When he, said, when he speaks, he lies. When he speaks, he lies. If you lie, this is of the attributes of the munafiqun. When he gives a promise, he breaks that promise. When he is given a trust and a manna, he breaks that trust. And in some hadith, he also said, When he argues, he uses vulgar talk. So to be vulgar, to be crude in your conversations, or in your, يعني, whatever you do, you are crude and vulgar, and you use arrogant talks and tones, this too is of the traits and characteristics of the hypocrites. It doesn't make you a hypocrite, but you are guilty of agreeing with the hypocrites in certain actions and certain uh, يعني, characteristics of yours. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. The question is about the Shia. I did not say that the Shia are kafirs like that. I said anyone who accuses Aisha of the crime that she is free of is a kafir. As for the Shia, uh, the correct opinion concerning them, like Ibn Taymiyyah and others said, ulama'uhum kafaru wa ammatuhum fasaku. Their ulama have become kuffar because they have studied the religion. They have studied the Quran and the Sunnah and they know that their religion is based upon kufr. But their awam, the average person that you meet, it is not necessary that he is a kafir. A person might be a Shia and he doesn't know that the Shia has claimed that Aisha did this and that she did. A person might be a Shia and he doesn't know half of the beliefs of the Shia. Therefore, a person tells you he's a Shia, don't immediately say you're a kafir. No. Ask him, what do you believe? Do you believe that Aisha did this crime? Do you believe that the Quran is incomplete? Do you believe that the Sahaba, all of them became kuffar? Do you believe, do you believe, do you believe? Keep on asking him. If he keeps on saying no, tell him, brother, you're not a Shia, even though you're claiming you are. The Shia believe this, 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 and prove it to them. There are many books out that uh, yani describe the aqidah of the Shia. The point is we have to be wise here. Many people are born in a Shia society, a Shia household, a Shia culture, and they grow up thinking that they're Shia. And the only difference, and I have people that have told me this, that have converted to Sunni Islam, the only thing they think is the difference is that the Shia pray with their hands down, and the Sunnis pray with their hands here. If this is what their version of Shiism is, then they are Muslims. 
they don't know Shia. They don't know what the Shi'ites are about. Therefore, like uh, Shaykh al-Islam said, the ulama, those that have studied the religion and they still believe in it, are kuffar. But their awam, their, their awam are kuffa, evil people. We have to give them da'wah and we have to invite them to Islam. The question is about uh, yani backbiting another person and you are in that gathering and you, the, the, another brother, brother or sister is being backbitten, what should you do? This is a very good question and again we, this happens all too commonly. Firstly, a person should defend the honor of his Muslim brother or sister if he is able to, if he can. Okay, the Prophet says, whoever defends the honor of a Muslim brother in his absence, listen to this hadith, it's an important hadith for us. And we should try to practice it because ghibah, we go anywhere we go and someone talks about our friend, our relative, they put him down, they make fun of him, they make fun of his looks, they make fun of his appearance, okay? they make fun of his profession, they make fun of his ethnicity, all of this is ghibah. You are saying something which you would not say to his face and you would not say in front of him, you are backbiting about him. So if you are able to defend, you are in a position to defend, then defend. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, he who defends the honor of, him, of his Muslim brother in his absence, then Allah will defend his face from the fire of hell. If you defend the honor of your Muslim brother, then Allah will defend you from the fire of hell on the day of Jesus. So if you're able to defend him, defend him. If you're not in a position to defend him, remind those people to fear Allah and not to backbite in this manner and do not be a part of this gathering because by being a part of this gathering, you are condoning the backbiting, you are condoning what is occurring. And if you're not able to defend him, don't participate. Remind them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suppose you don't know that person and they make fun of him. Or they say something about him or her. And you don't know him personally, you cannot defend him. Nor do you know anyone else that can defend him. In this case, you remind them to fear Allah. Brother and sister, what you have said is not correct. You are backbiting him. Or you are slandering him. Or you are saying something you yourself do not know. Remember the Prophet sallallahu said another very important hadith. كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ كَذِبًا أَنْ يُحَدِّكَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمِعْ It is enough of a person to be a liar that he spreads everything that he hears. It's enough to lie that you spread everything you hear. And notice, these three Sahaba that were whipped, they did not concoct the lie. Abdullah ibn Ubi ibn Salud, he was the one who concocted the lie. But they spread it, and that was enough for them to be guilty. It is enough of a person to be a liar that you spread everything you hear. If you don't verify, you don't confirm, you don't ascertain, you just keep on going. Like the Quran says, When you passed it from tongue to tongue, and you thought that this was something very trivial, and it was in the sight of Allah, very great, very, very grand. Therefore, do not be a part of such gatherings. Warn these type of people. And if people do nothing but backbite, change your face. Don't be around people that remind you of backbite. Rather be around people who remind you of Allah and the Messenger. The brother, again a very important question, how far should you go to verify some news? How far should you go to confirm whether it's true or not? This is indeed a topic in and of itself, a long topic. But to summarize, we have to differentiate between that news which will not cause any effect on your life and that news which will cause an effect on your life. For example, someone comes and tells you a certain MP or a certain politician or a certain whatever has passed away or died in a car accident or this and that happened. In reality, it is not going to affect your aqidah. Nor will it affect your worship of Allah. Nor does it have anything to do with you. So if that brother is trustworthy, you take his news. No big deal. Okay, so and so died in a car accident. Or he died in this place. Or something happened. You understand, some type of news which is not, will not affect you. It will not affect your iman. It will not affect your daily life. In this case, any trustworthy brother comes to you with any type of information, you may accept it from him if you think that he is trustworthy and you know him. However, there is another piece of news which will affect you. It will be a practical benefit. And it will cause an effect on your life. In this case, you must verify and confirm as much as possible. Even if a trustworthy person comes to you, you should confirm. Because what happens most of the time is the trustworthy person himself is not speaking from first-hand information. He himself is speaking from rumors and from second-hand sources. So, in, the, in this case, for example, Hamana, 
uh, excuse me, Umm Misbah herself speaks. But Aisha says, and in the hadith is explicit, I want you to verify from my parents. And uh, Umm Misbah was not one who was not thiqa. Of course she was uh, of great character, a noble character. Of course she was trustworthy and honest. But to prove the importance of this thing, don't just accept one person. Go to someone who without a doubt, her own mother and father, if they confirm these rumors, then for sure it has to be affirmed. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ heard some rumors of Abdullah ibn Umar. And he called Abdullah ibn Umar and he said, I have heard that you fast all day and pray all night and do not approach your life. The one that came and told him this, according to the son of Rishas of Umar, according to some other, other people, but all of them trustworthy Sahaba. But the Prophet ﷺ confirmed it directly from Abdullah ibn Umar. Likewise, a wife came to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said, and this is an important hadith, so we're going to two minutes here, it's an important hadith. She said, Ya Rasulullah, my husband does not pray. And when I fast, he prevents me from fasting. And when I say the prayer, he causes me to break my prayer. Now this Sahabiyyah is not accused of lying. She is not a fasiq, a fasiq meaning an evil person. Okay? And without a doubt, when an evil person, a person whom you don't trust, comes to you, no matter what he says, doubt him. Even if it's of no value to you, doubt him. He is known that he is an evil person, he loves gossip, he loves tales, he loves rumors, he has shown his reputation that he is not trustworthy. Therefore, doubt him. But we're talking about when an innocent person, when one whom you trust comes to you. So this Sahabiya came to the Prophet and described her husband in this manner. These characteristics are enough pretty much to get a pronouncement of takfir on him. He doesn't pray. When she prays, he breaks her prayer, he forces her to break the prayer, and when she fasts, he forces her to break the fast. This is not the characteristic of a pious mu'min, is it? Rather, it is the characteristic of a munafiq and a kafir. But the Prophet ﷺ did not pass a verdict, pass a judgment, until he had called the other party, called the husband. This is a verdict now. You are pronouncing whether a person is a Muslim or a kafir. You are pronouncing, for example, if he, if he is of Ahlul Sunnah or Jama'ah or not. Don't just take one side of the story. Listen to the other side as well. So he called the husband and look at how every single charge has been cleared. The wife sees it and she is not lying but she sees it from a narrow perspective. But the husband manages to clear up these crimes and he is the innocent one and she is the guilty one. How? She says, he says, Ya Rasulullah, as for not waking up for the prayer, then I have a problem that is well known in my family that once I go to sleep I cannot wake up. It's something hereditary. That I cannot wake up for Fajr. They can try to wake me up. This is a problem, a disease that I have. That once I go to sleep, I cannot wake up until I wake up naturally. That is why I do not pray Fajr. So the Prophet said, Okay, when you wake up, if this is true, and it really is true, let not, let not this be an excuse for us not to wake up for Fajr. This is a problem, a disease that he has. Okay? So he said, the Prophet said, When you wake up, then pray your Fajr immediately. First, first crime, absolved. Second crime, Ya Rasulullah, I am a young man. And I desire my wife. And when I come home from work, I find her fasting. Nothing fasting. I desire her, but I can't have her if she is fasting. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Let no woman fast except with her husband's permission. She is the guilty party, not him. He has every right to take this benefit from his wife as long as the fast is nothing and not the first fast of Ramadan. The third point. What is your response, O man, O husband? Ya Rasulullah, once again I am a young man. And she offers long prayers. She reads long surahs. All I request is that she pray quickly. She reads short surahs. I, don't, I cannot bear half hour, an hour that she is praying. I am a young man coming home from work and I wish to enjoy him. So the Prophet said that in that case read small surahs and pray quickly. So you see now, what the wife said is all correct and authentic. She's not lying. But she has a narrow perspective. She's distorting a little bit to get some verdict against her husband. She's not lying. But the husband is able to clear himself of all of the charges. And in fact, if you like the guilt is upon the wife, she must now not fast to accept with her husband's permission. And she must not now pray. She must not pray long prayers. Uh, she must pray short prayers, pray quickly, and get over her fard salah, and not pray sunnah and nafid, except with her husband's permission. So you see now, when you're pronouncing a verdict, like in this case, when you're judging, like in this case, then it is imperative that you hear both sides of the story. I would also like to point out, there is a third category of news, 
and that which is of no concern to you is not going to affect you at all, yet it is religious in nature. In this case, don't waste your time with it. If it will not affect you, so and so is supposed on a certain bid'ah group or not, and you don't know him, neither do you benefit from his effect, nor is it not related to you at all. On the day of judgment, Allah will not ask you about this person. He will ask you about you. He will ask you about your salah. He will ask you about your siyam. He will ask you about your knowledge. He will ask you about your actions. He will not ask you about a person living 2,000 miles away and what was your relationship with him which was not existing. He will not ask you what did you think of him. You can say, Ya Allah, that person had nothing to do with him. It's nothing to do with me. Therefore, I ignored the whole issue. So I didn't care about it. And this too is an important category. You don't have to verify and confirm rumors which have nothing to do with you. Get on with your life. Allah will not ask you about these things. He will ask you about your khushu in the salah, your humility in the salah. He will ask you about how much sadaqah, how much siyam, how much fasting, how much love, how much taqwa you have. So get involved with that which is important and leave, ignore those rumors which are of no value to you. Wallahu alaikum. Okay, so we're going to have time now. It's um, time to shift his talk next, inshallah. Um, we're just going to have time for literally a three minute 